Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this symposium, Researching Motions, Past, Present and Future. Um, this research symposium is showcasing some of the diversity uh, and breadth of emotions research at the University of New England. The event arose from the realisation uh, earlier this year that UNE now has a critical mass of researchers investigating emotions from a diverse perspective in arts, humanities and social sciences. Above all, the last year or so, I use so rather generously, has seen the appointment of several academic staff at UNE who have been involved in the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions as postdoctoral fellows or associate investigators. For the past seven years, the centre has played a pivotal role in transforming arts and humanities research in Australia, fostering transdisciplinary uh, dialogue and leading a national and international community focused upon the common question of what can we learn and benefit from researching emotions in the past, present and future. The centre is now transitioning to a three-year post-ARC period in which it will continue under the present name to support a large network of researchers. As some of you know, the centre was structured around a team of chief investigators and centre directors at the lead institution, the University of Western Australia, and nodes, a lovely reference to network theory, at the University of Adelaide, uh, the University of Melbourne, the University of Sydney and the University of Brisbane. In this new era for the centre, there is an opportunity to expand the network and include new nodes. Given the speakers you will hear today and the research work being done by others here at UNE, including Dr. Francois Sawyer, uh, Dr. Julia Torello Hill, and Dr. Rose Williamson, the emerging profile of research training in history of emotions, and this initiative affords UNE a distinct opportunity for being recognised for its emotions research on the national stage and participating in the next big thing in arts, humanities and social sciences research in Australia. The centre was sponsored the Centre has sponsored this symposium by promoting it on its website and social network social media network, a meaningful gesture for which we are most grateful. The sheer elegance of focusing on emotions research is understood by many in the room since it doesn't require researchers to throw out the baby with bath water to jettison their present methods and approaches. Rather, it enriches them. The centre caught and rode on the crest of a wave of new scholarship. Since the emotional turn in the early 2000s, the research into the nature and role of emotions in human society and culture has emerged as a powerful approach for transferring scholarship and for fostering transdisciplinary dialogue and collaboration. At the same time, the, national, the traditional disciplines have been reinvigorated by theoretical frameworks and transdisciplinary thought. William Reddy's regimes of emotion in early modern Europe Harbour Rosenwein's emotional communities in the early Middle Ages, Monica Shears Bordeaux Ian based theory of practiced emotions, and Martha Neusbaum's championing of a cognitive theory of emotions as a foundation for moral theory and ethics are but a few of the pillars upon which an explosion of emotions research has developed in the last decade. Emotions research is now mainstream and its future is bright. With these thoughts in mind, I would now like to open this symposium's <coughs> proceedings. Papers will be run back to back with a half hour block for discussions at the end of the third paper. Unless you have some burning desire to ask a point of clarification at the <coughs> end of the paper, please reserve your questions and points of discussion until the end of the third paper in each session. For the first session, I will chair um, another emotions researcher I've already mentioned, Dr. Francois Soyer, will kind, kindly chair the second session. There will be afternoon tea, which is served between the first and second sessions. Afternoon tea is provided by another ex external super, uh, sponsor, the Australian Music Psychology Society. Um, just a couple of other points. Um, this is being this whole symposium is being recorded and recording may be publicly available. 
um, and that when you do ask a question, please ensure that you have the microphone in hand. And, uh, and also, please ensure that you have your mobile phone uh, so turned to silent. OK, so it gives me great delight, and there's a slight change in the program at the moment, um, to welcome the first speaker. And the first speaker is Kate Dowd. And Kate Dowd's written a book on um, digital journalism, drones and automation. Um, she has, as you can read in your notes, a, a, a great experience across a range of industries. Um, her, she's taught many units at UNE um, in so, so digital and social media, film techniques and digital effects, and news and journalism. Um, and between 2013, she was an executive member of the Australian New Zealand Communication Association. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And uh, remains a member of the, uh, commun the Communication uh, Research and Practice Editorial Board. Um, one thing I want to point out is, is Kate's experience. Um, after, before she was at Monash um, lecturing on information systems, um, she was a radio producer also and editing assistant with the South Australian Film Corporation and Corfer Productions. Um, and most interestingly, she is also a certified unmanned aerial vehicle controller. So without further ado, I'd like to thank Kate, who will speak on emotion-based intelligence, RoboJournal. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Thanks for that uh, glowing introduction, Jason. Um, I'm not up for flying a drone today, um, but I am going to talk about emotion-based intelligence. Now, this uh, research, a lot of this research was done um, about eight years ago before I came to UNE, uh, and uh, I thought it was interesting to sort of open it up again and have a look at some of the, um, the research that I'd done previously and how it fits into uh, current uh, discussions on emotions. Um, prior to this, I actually read this great book called What is the History of Emotions? Um, by uh, Barbara Rosenvine, which was just, uh, Jason just mentioned and Ricardo Cristiani, and I can just recommend this book. It's a, a really good read, um, and it's got a lovely sweep in there on uh, the focus of emotions. So going through from the medieval period, um, looking at the, even the heart as a centre for the emotions, which is contrary to the uh, focus on emotions in contemporary time, which of course is more focused on the brain and cognitive systems. Um, of course, Diana Barnes will be talking about um, medieval emotions, so I'll leave that to her because that's really her world. And, uh, but I thought it was a great read to just kind of segue uh, into this um, symposium. Uh, that there from, is from 1673, and I thought that was fascinating. There's not much brain inside there, but um, I am going to acknowledge the brain. And the reason I want to do this is that um, there, there is actually a focus in my prior research on language. Now, the language, language in the brain is one thing, but when you're talking about computing systems and you look at language, it's very text-based. So all computer programs are, are still written, believe it or not, just with simple text. And maybe the day will come when uh, computer instructions will be done with colour coding. Wouldn't that be exciting? Uh, and computer programs might be re reinvented. Um, so, but because I didn't put this in my previous research, I thought it was important to just acknowledge and make note of this uh, important area. Uh, emotions are in the uh, limbic system, uh, essentially that's where a lot of the activity is. Uh, and then the spinal cord is sort of there going down through your body and triggering out all different kinds of neurotransmitters and responses. Uh, and I think this fits in well with the, the talk that's going to be happening this evening. Um, and probably there'll be a lot more information on that. I was fascinated uh, as I looked at this uh, by the, the biochemical side of it, because as I said, I previously just looked at the language side of and text-based side of emotions when I did my research. Uh, and I think this just uh, deserves a, a whole lot more uh, research for the future. Um, 
uh, many years ago. Some people don't know this, but I was actually a nurse many years ago, and uh, I studied the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's, it's not in my bio, sorry, Jason. But I, I thought that this was an interesting area to sort of look at um, further, whether it's meant to be simulated or not for uh, robo-journo concepts is another uh, idea, but the, the, the physiology of emotions is important. And I think what I really want to say is that the autonomic nervous system is really important because it's something that you can't necessarily control. <coughs> it's, a, it's a deeper inner uh, part of the brain, um, unlike um, other voluntary systems that you can control. Okay, now I won't read all this, but uh, I'll highlight a few things here um, as we go through. Uh, also, I just want to point out the elicitation of language right in the centre there um, was a, an important part of my previous research. And that meant involving journalists, because I was working with journalists uh, in workshops. So I ran participatory workshops. And uh, the, the point was to try and get context-defined emotions and consider how they could be applied to game systems for learning, for training. Um, and since this time, uh, emotion annotation, now I'll use that word, some people will know mm -hmm. that, others won't. Uh, annotation is like markup annotations in computer programming. So emotion annotation, since I did this research, have actually progressed. And many of you probably don't realise, but there is a lot of emotion annotation already happening, and there are standards set for it. And social media is exploiting it probably more than anyone. Search engines as well, but social media companies have invested in emotion behaviour engines. So my research was suggesting, a, as you can see at the top of the abstract here, building a behaviour engine with emotion-based intelligence, but for journalism. And I wanted to have an ethical stance into that. So trying to integrate not just work processes in, say, journalism, how that domain works, but how you would add possibly emotions into that to drive learning systems. Some of this research, in fact most of it, what I'm going to talk about now, is already published in uh, Lecture Notes in Computer Science, and uh, this is the uh, version of that, uh, the volume. Uh, it's a persu persuasive technology conference that was held here in Sydney, um, and it's called The Scrabble of Language Towards Pers Persuasion. Um, the point here was to explore, within this article you'll see, if you get a chance to look at it, uh, was to look at context, the design of context-aware systems. Um, so emotion intelligence extends the idea of AI. The areas that I was looking at were the intersections of journalism, social media and public relations because emotions on their own in one domain don't particularly have much strength. They work better when they're in, you know, so journalism and public relations are two different kind of worlds. Their values and their ethics are different. And so when you put these together, you can create some really, you can see some really interesting tensions that can work quite well for gameplay. So synthetic player ideas in systems. Um, but also the other thing is these things help to um, uh, sort of understand the domain. So exploring them uh, was useful uh, just in, the, in a broader sense. Um, now, the two, two main things here are vocabulary and concepts. Uh, and so what I did was I developed a pack of emotion cards that I used with participants. And the cards, there were only 20 of them, uh, and they were derived from uh, another couple of lists uh, to try and simplify things. And I'll just go through to the next slide to show you. Uh, there was some here. This is the 20 that I came up with. And then I converted these into little cards that could be used within exercises, within participatory workshops. They were based on these two models, which some of you will have heard of, the OCC model and also the um, Ekman model. Okay, so uh, this, they, they were kind of, you know, in a fuzzy way, if you like, derived from other um, examples of emotions. Uh, there were two. What, what's interesting here is in the workshops, I allowed journalists to have that freedom to add their own emotions, and two that they came up with consistently were panic and relief <laughs> at getting stories. And I just thought that was really interesting. 
um, that they came up with those. There were others. There's, there's quite a lot of rich data that I had from this research and I can only really skin the surface of it today. Um, now, following the participatory workshops, what I did was I uh, added these two different diagrams to try and see if you could model any of the emotions into work processes for future systems or system ideas. An example would be RoboJourno, which is just like a little synthetic player in a game, which might be going around through a training game telling you this and that, you know, uh, asserting certain values, reinforcing learning. Uh, this diagram here is called an activity diagram. It's uh, what's known as a UML diagram. There's many UML diagrams. This is just one. And it just highlights kind of decision pathways, possible pathways. So, you know, you have different states, a starting point state and a finish state. And then you have like a, this path and then you have two paths. I mean, this is, these are great little models for determining whether you might take two paths or three paths or four, you know, and, and just sort of tidying up whatever you want uh, in a system. Finite state machines, I'm going to talk about this shortly, um, but the finite state machines are a little different. They actually are diagrams that show transitions between states. So you've got the idea here of a state, a starting state and a, an end state. So th this one is journalists to verify evolving terror story on a fancy island, uh, then to publish the story. And all these things happen in between to get to that story. So the transition, finite state machine, though, is something that's in between these states. And that's where I thought it might be interesting to see if emotions might work and how, because, it, because journalists are driven by emotions. Every, every profession is driven by some archetypal emotions. So I'll just um, show you this before I show you the finite state machine. Um, within, as I gathered a lot of the data, um, these were the kinds of things that I did to create some context-based uh, so the roles here, you can see in one column, the kind of typical tasks, they're deliberately short, you know, kind of specific little tasks. And then emotions before the interaction, before those little tasks, and then after. So for example, down here, an editor deciding on an approach to a story uh, and gathering tips, maybe doing, and this data, by the way, is all gathered from journalists, experienced journalists. They were investigative journalists from uh, Four Corners, Dateline, so SBS, ABC, and various other organisations. So bargaining and curiosity uh, before an interaction, uh, here with deciding on a story, and then after interaction there's understanding. You might argue are these uh, emotions or behaviours, sometimes they kind of straddle between emotions and behaviours. I wasn't too fussed about that. The idea was to try and see what we could find out. And then what you can, what, what, what's happening next here is that I, I took these, some samples of these, um, tasks and actions, and I tried to put them into simple statements. And the idea is, when I say simple, they're not simple. They're, they're complex statements, but they're statements that are used in the computing environment. And uh, there's a lot of different forms of logic that are used to build a computer system. And this particular example is called the Hoare logic. And uh, it's basically where you've got, if you can see, uh, so you've got curiosity here, which was derived from the previous table, publishing the story, and then a sense of satisfaction. You've got um, what you've got is a precondition for a computer, and you've got a postcondition, and this is the command. And so this essentially, being satisfied, always holds whenever you've got these two at work. In computing terms, whoops, I'll just go to this. In computing terms, this combination, like this little statement, if you like, is called a triple. That's why I put the one, two, three there. And that triple is important because it's a triple that's used in all the database. Um, the data mining that's now out there. So when you think of cloud servers and, and uh, data mining uh, and automation, you need to, uh, I think it's, it's worth knowing that triples are what drives the automation. So uh, the idea here is that you could create a whole lot of statements, and once you've got a whole lot of statements, you then create what's called a behaviour engine. Okay? So now, behaviour engines already exist and they exist for emotions, and guess who's got one? Facebook. Okay, so I did this research before Facebook developed its uh, uh, game, in its emotion engine, uh, but they have a text-based, so that they, again, it's all text-based, so they're, they're not um, doing anything on your neurotransmitters, but they are kind of, um, you know, watching your text and the way it's keyed in, and 
and they can use these triples to cross-reference. Cross-referencing is an important part of it. Um, okay, I'm just about to uh, fast forward here. We've got some other examples there uh, in a triple that you might have. So comp uh, you're competitive as a journalist. You want a scoop. Someone says get a scoop. Uh, you might be smug after you've got the scoop, yeah? There were a lot of funny scenarios that journalists put forward about, you know, getting a Walkley Award and then handing back the Walkley Award when something else happens, and I thought that was um, really interesting. So what, what happens is with all these statements is that you can add um, values to these because they become objects, uh, and then they can be embedded into algorithms. But the point here, <coughs> excuse me, the point here is that it's the articulation of the language that's important or that was important to go with those um, sort of understanding of those emotions. But the point is they're not real emotions, they're representations. Actually, they're not even representations. To represent emotions is another story, and, it's, and there's no representation of emotions in what I'm showing you here. Except for there's diagrams and models to show you the logic and the process that can, can, cross, can possibly occur. So uh, this is a finite state machine diagram. It's very boring. You've probably, anyone who's played a game, sent a synthetic player, and it runs off and it comes back and it does all the same kinds of things, a little bit of variation here and there. So this was a, a robo-journo idea with a press release. So you get, this is the news gathering home. The press release comes in. This can be a prompt for a story. It happens all the time in journalism. They get so many press releases, they're never quite sure whether they should follow the lead and, take, and write a story. Uh, a lot of them, there's even little animations where press releases get trashed, okay? So that was in inspiring for this. Uh, now, these are the values in journalism, requesting to verify a story, getting opposing views and so on. You might, if it's not newsworthy, you might trash the press release. But if it is, the robo-journal would just go back to its home base. So this is a loop. This goes around and around and around. But what I put into the middle here, in the, or sorry, into the transitions between each state, is some of the emotions that I had uh, emotion language that was used in the workshops, that was derived from the workshops. So curiosity was put in here, uh, bargaining and truth was put in here at this different stage, um, and then I added things like low health if you, the press release turned out not to be um, useful, um, good health for a, a game player if it, if it was actually uh, a good lead for a story, and so on. So it's a simple model. Synthetic players use these kinds of loops all the time, um, but the point is here that you could use a, similar models to this to build more context-based uh, emotions. So as I said, exploration allows for reflection and deeper understanding on the roles and practices in journalism and indeed the values that are happening in journalism amidst great change. So even uh, eight years ago, this is what was driving me, was to try and understand the, um, the, the, what actually exists in this domain. And part of doing that is uh, what I talked about last time when I did a talk, some of you may have heard it, uh, was to uh, build an ontology for this area, ontology for journalism. So I had ontologies for journalism, social media, and for public relations. And as you can see, I had emotions in what's called the top level layer of this ontology, starting ontology. Uh, there, is, there are emotion <coughs> ontologies. I'm not sure if people are aware of that already. There are emotion ontologies. So this is just sort of a little a bubble that feeds into the rest of the context base um, for this particular domain, which is uh, journalism. Uh, and I've, I've, these, these are published in the lecture notes in computer science. So I'll just bring back to the point of cross-referencing. The reason you uh, would be exploring language and vocabularies uh, for these ends uh, fits very well with the existing use of vocabularies in online news and the way that uh, cognitive computing is using semantic search. Yeah. So this is semantic search and, um, uh, and this can inform the future of journalism. I think from the previous talk, um, I think there's a need to reconsider the transactions in online news and, uh, and they need well-formed vocabularies, including emotions, uh, and they are expo exploited, as I said, uh, by uh, social media. And this is discussed in my forthcoming book. It's a bit later, this book, Oxford University Press, it'll be 2019, early 2019 coming out. Um, I just want to finish by saying um, I, I really appreciate the limbic system more than I ever did since I had a car accident. And I also was fascinated by this link between emotions and speech and language 
uh, and how they're in close proximity within the brain. Uh, and um, I just thank God that I can actually speak still because <laughs> I did have a stutter for a while. Um, but look, I think there's a lot of research going on in this area that uh, people can tap into um, and it includes ethics and I think it's really important to have ethics um, uh, in your research in, in relation to the use of emotions. Uh, and if anyone's interested in at the senior level of exploring uh, research possibilities, I'd be happy to uh, talk with you about these intersections between emotions, ethics and vocabularies for online journalism and social media systems that have an ethical stance. And that's it from me. Thank you. Maybe a simple question, but so does the um, emotion, uh, curio the emotions stem um, from the curiosity? Sorry. So, so where does the curiosity come from? Is that oh, I don't know. <laughs> where so does curiosity come from? Um, mm -hmm. that I don't know. That, yes. that, that, uh, you're talking about in terms of that model. Yes. Yeah. Well, they were just they were just words nominated by journalists to describe what happens before they get a story. Yeah. They were there was curiosity. That's how they described it. I'll just add one thing quickly is to, to answer this is um, all this logic and processes that I've talked about is often referred to as descript description logic because it's only descriptive. It's not representative, and I think that's a really important point. Okay. Thank you. So, um, whilst I'm introducing the next speaker, Diana Barnes, um, okay, yes, slight change of technology here. Um, so, we're resuming. Uh, we're resuming normal programming, and um, it gives me pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Diana Barnes. Now, Dr. Diana Barnes is one of the people that have recently joined us, um, who has been a postdoctoral fellow with the ARC Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions, has been involved since its instantiation, indeed, with the centre. And um, so she brings a wealth of knowledge um, and a fine background on which uh, many a conversation I've already held with Diana has been quite enriching. Um, so Diana is lecturer at the University of New England, as, as it says here. Um, and um, uh, her book, The Epistolary Community of Print, 1580 to um, 1664 was published in 2013 by Ashgate, uh, which, as many of us know, was gobbled up by Rutledge. Um, in the history of motion, she was published on uh, Bialana Harvey. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Harley. Puritan emotional ideas from marriage and Andrew Marvell's stoic response to civil war epistolary love in Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor and has a forthcoming chapter on representation of war and passion in Margaret Cavendish plays of 1662. Um, she's currently researching and doing some exciting things that I'll tell you more about at the end of this symposium on the relationship between gender and early modern neo-stoicism in literature. Without further ado, welcome Diana. Thank you. Okay, I should say I know for sure this paper is longer than the 20 minutes allocated, so I'm going to try and skip across bits and jump across bits, but bear with me, please. Scholars have established the importance of Stoicism to intellectual, literary and political writing of 17th century England, but they have not adequately considered women's contribution to it or the gendering of the discourse. Accounts of neo-Stoicism tend to focus upon philosophical tracts and canonical literature. Women's contributions were less likely than their male peers to have been part of the public published record. When women such as Dorothy Osborne, Brilliana Harley, Margaret Cavendish or Catherine Phillips write of emotion or its restraint, it is widely assumed to be personal. The archives hold the keys to understanding women's responses to neo-stoicism and the radical debates fostered under its rubric. I do not allude to the possibility of discovering forgotten <coughs> philosophical tracts 
but rather to a wholesale review of quotidian ephemera, including letters, commonplace books and diaries, texts that are not usually part of the scholarly discussion of Stoicism. Such traces and fragments provide glimpses of partial arguments and adaptations that will serve as evidence of both women's involvement in the dissemination of Stoic discourse and the, gender, the gendering of neo-Stoic ideas. In broad terms, 17th century English history involved the build-up to, experience of, and aftermath of civil war. During this period, ideological debates raged across the country and passionately held religious and political views, split families and communities. In this volatile climate, people were drawn to the classical Stoic idea of withdrawal or apathia. Following Seneca, self-preservation was <coughs> achieved by maintaining some distance from the state. This was not exactly a retreat from emotion, but rather the repudiation of violent emotions in favour of reasoned states of feeling. The Stoic holds that the violent disruptions of public life are fuelled by anger, fear and envy, emotions provoked by the vicissitudes of fortune. The Stoic advocates the quiet life in a community of a few like-minded friends where natural virtue and reason are unimpeded. Such constancy is maintained by individual vigilance and a readiness to engage in the dialectical process of rationally deflecting violent emotions. The emphasis is upon voluntarism, or the will of the individual to manage his or her own emotional life, and it links this private rational activity to the public world. This is not a solitary retreat from politics, but a means of affirming and articulating ideals for political and social life. Stoicism is a philosophical movement concerned with the management of public life and community. By and large, 17th century neo-Stoic philosophy, that is classical Stoicism adapted to Christian mores, uncritically adopted the implicitly masculine vision of classical Stoicism. Nevertheless, it did not overtly exclude women. Neo-Stoics broadly endorsed the classical Stoic idea of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism namely that all individuals have equal value and relatedly the ideal of global citizenship. Stoic ideas are foundational to natural law, that is the principle that a person's virtue and disposition derives from his or her natural capacity to reason. And the reconceptualization of natural law was key to those early modern theories of the state and natural rights, and I'm thinking of Grotius and Pufendorf, from which many of our own ideas about politics derive. However, women are largely absent from the neo-Stoic vision of social and political community, and natural law can be used to justify traditional prejudices such as man's natural superiority to women. Nevertheless, as 17th century women recognised, neo-Stoicism provided useful tools, not least the view that private virtue impacted the public world. Stoicism was so pervasive in this period that it is sometimes difficult to discern it at work. Consider, for example, the standard precepts for women's behaviour, <coughs> silence, obedience and constancy. Gervais Markham uh, was not substantially reworking an old theme when he stressed in his 1615 tract, The English Housewife, that the good housewife should cultivate inward, the inward virtue of constancy and, above all, avoid violence of spirit, particularly in religion. Of this temperate quality, he elaborated that wifely shunning of all violence, rage, and passion, rage, passion, and humour would entail appearing unto her husband pleasant, amiable, and delightful. If the wife were to observe her husband's misgovernment, Markham recommends that she should virtuously suppress her thoughts and with a mild sufferance call him home from his error rather than with strength of anger. Words spoken in anger, Markham reminds, are evil and uncomely. Through such diligent emotional management, he declared, we build forts against the adversities of fortune, provided that such preservation be honest and conscionable, for as lavish prodigality is brutish, so miserable covetousness is hellish. Here, Markham echoes the militaristic language of the Neo-Stoics, particularly Justice Lipsius, who I'll talk about a bit later. Such tenets for female behaviour predate 17th century neo-Stoicism, yet to acknowledge the Stoic undertones of this utterly conventional ideal opens up analysis of the women who represented their lives in these terms, and also women's access to the intellectual discourses that gave such statements authority. 
As Mary Ellen Lamb tells us, humanist educationalists recognise the particular relevance of classical stoicism to women. Juan Louis Vives, for example, encouraged them to read Seneca. Stoicism provides a way to interpret feminine silence, retreat and passivity not as obedience to age-old social mores, but as evidence of women's engagement with public and intellectual culture. The most recent uh, major contribution to the understanding of neo-Stoicism in relation to 17th century literature is Andrew Schliffert's book Stoicism, Politics and Literature in the Age of Milton. He pictures this uh, book as a critique of the history of ideas, particularly his target is Quentin Skinner. Quentin Skinner, whereas Quentin Skinner identifies the political significance of 17th century Stoicism as, and I'm quoting Skinner, being the idea that everyone has a duty to submit himself to the existing order of things, never resisting the prevailing government, but accepting and where necessary enduring it with fortitude, Shiftlet offers a contrary position, insisting that in England at least, Stoicism was seldom about never resisting. Um, indeed, it was a form of subtle casuistry and political engagement. It was a means of mapping out a middle path between public and private life. Stoicism often meant retreat from the state, but not from political action. It could be a means of critique, a stepping back from the maelstrom of public life to allow measured judgment. Shiftlet specifies and stresses that such activity was increasingly, quote, conceived as a matter of writing and publication within the Republic of Letters. This is his pitch for the importance of literature to an understanding of neo-Stoicism, to which entry was freely offered to those with ability and those and whose values were critical of tradition, struggling to replace the arbitrary exercise of power by rational political debate. There is a hierarchy of forms at work here. Shiflet intervenes in intellectual history to demonstrate how canonical writers, and they're mostly male, take up Stoicism. And he deploys what he calls the lesser writers to illuminate that account. Stoic and neo-Stoic philosophy was certainly set forth in philosophical tracts and canonical literature. But it also pervades quotidian forms such as the letter, consider Cicero and Seneca, and brief occasional forms such as the essay, and here we have Montaigne. Such everyday modes of writing present Stoicism as a philosophy derived from and embedded within life. And the inalienable sociability of epistolary form, which will be the focus of this paper, um, for example, demonstrated the sociability essential to its moral conception of the good life as focused upon benefiting others. So now I'm going to consider briefly, and I'm not quite sure how briefly the second one will be, two case studies. One is Rilliana Harley's letters to her son, just on the eve of the English Civil War, and the second is a sequence of letters written by Dorothy Osborne to her future husband um, just after uh, the interregnum, so after the execution of the king and the um, period of parliament um, governed politics. Okay. Stoic principles gleaned from Seneca underpin the code of behaviour Brilliana Harley modelled and advocated in letters to her son Edward Harley, or Ned, who was studying at Oxford in the years immediately prior to the outbreak uh, of civil war. Harley was a moderate Puritan, an adherent of non-sectarian Calvinism and a supporter of the National Church. A Stoic thread runs through 17th century Calvinism, following the example of Erasmus, Calvin had published a commentary on Seneca's On Mercy. Harley did not advocate Stoic apathia per se, nor was the moral code she distilled from her reading specifically concerned with women's behaviour. It can be detected, however, in the passive terms in which she describes her resignation to fortune with phrases such as, I hope the Lord will give me strength to bear what he lays upon me, as she wrote in a letter to her husband. In a 1638 letter urging her son Ned to resist the temptation to dress flamboyantly as she feared other Oxford students might be, um, she urged him to be content with plain clothes, even if others of his rank wore better clothes. This was his father's desire, she reminded him. She reinforced her call for sobriety and obedience by invoking Seneca. Seneca hath not got that victory over himself. For in his country house he lived privately, yet he complains that when he came to the court, he found a tickling desire to be like them at court. Here Harley invokes Seneca as one who lived, like the Harleys for the most part, at a sufficient distance from the state to allow a more moral life. 
This lifestyle did not immure him from temptation when he returned to society, however. As the Senecan example shows, the virtuous life must be vigilantly upheld. It's a constant process of self-examination rather than an end point. A reference to the court is pointed, as the Harley stood on the side of Parliament in the unfolding civil wars. Although at this stage, when this letter was written, they conceived this position not as ideological opposition to royalism per se, but rather as circumstantial opposition to particular tenets of royalism as upheld by Charles I and his supporters. On another occasion, Harley cites Seneca when discussing the May 1641 execution of one of the King's most staunch supporters, Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford and Lord Deputy of Ireland. Strafford was impeached <coughs> by the Long Parliament, primarily for his role in planning an Irish invasion of England to rally support for the Crown. The Strafford case was extraordinarily divisive. The fact that Charles I signed the death warrant was taken as evidence that his disloyalty was so profound that it extended to his friends and allies. The King lost many supporters. I'm glad that justice is executed on my Lord Strafford, who I think died like a Seneca, but not one that had tasted the mystery of godliness, Harley wrote. Here, she alludes not to Seneca's suicide, but to his submission to the state and acceptance of fortune. Seneca was a means of identifying the resignation and fortitude with which Strafford, Strafford met his fate, which Harley thought justly de deserved. Harley's approach was distinctly Christian. Like Seneca's translator, the Dutch neo-Stoic Justice Lipsius, Harley viewed Senecan morals as entirely amenable to Christian values. Making this explicit, after mentioning Strafford, she added, my dear Ned, let this example make you experimentally wise in God's word, which has set forth the prosperity of the wicked to be but for a time. He flourishes but for a time in his life, nor in his death has to be but, oh, sorry, nor in his death has peace, but the godly has that continual peace, the peace of a good conscience. Senecan ethics underpin Harley's understanding of the good Christian life, specifically her ideas about how to manage the vicissitudes of emotion inevitably associated with the mounting social and political tensions of which she writes. To this end, Harley draws upon Stoicism when she reviews a book her son has shared with her. The subject is very needful to be known, she writes, and the author of it is of judgment. Therefore, I believe he has done it well. The well-knowing how far our passions are good and how far evil, and the right way to govern them is difficult. And in my observation, I see but few that are studious to govern their passions, and it is our passions that troubles ourselves and others. As these examples show, Harley viewed Stoicism as a means of self-management, particularly useful for the individual at odds with his or her political, social or religious setting. In the pedagogical tradition of Seneca's letters to Luc Lucillus, Harley addresses her son as a young man engaged in self-improvement. She advises him on how to maintain moral integrity and immure himself from the surrounding furor of religious and political opinion and behavior. Her use of Stoic discourse is gender neutral. She cites it as an aid to life in society. Admittedly, such theories are more applicable to the kind of life a man might lead, but Harley does not highlight this. The implication is that her son will learn certain skills at Oxford and not others. As his mother and governor of the Harley household, she cites Seneca to convey a set of values and model the kind of constant dialectical process that underpins a good life. Fortune will throw up situations that stir up passions. We're all subject to fate. We cannot control what fortune presents, but we can control how we respond to it. Harley encourages Ned to diligently brace himself to meet his fortune ethically. He should subject the emotions provoked by experience to reason and thereby quell the war between passionate impulse and reason that is natural to each of us, and replace it with constancy, peace, goodwill, and utility. This is not exactly a matter of living without emotion, although it has been characterized as such. As such. Rather, it's about establishing a state of mind that will enable rational, affective actions, as one philosopher put it. For Harley, then, Stoicism is authorized by classical intellectual tradition, but distinct from university learning. It's a practical philosophy embedded in everyday life. So now, let me just consider the time frame. How much more time have I got? Five minutes. Okay, so my second example is Dorothy Osborne, who writes uh, uh, to her 
future husband. Now I've lost my pages. Well, I don't seem to have them all here anyway, so that's, that's kind of convenient. So she writes to her future husband, um, Sir William Temple, asking him to govern his passions and talking a lot about her own passions. And each of her letters starts with an emotion. Anger has caused this, um, apology this, uh, etc. Uh, but she proposes to her husband that their relationship should be based not upon love but upon friendship. And the reason she does this is because love involves those passions that drive one towards madness, that are unruly and ungovernable, whereas friendship is always about equality, constancy, and this kind of thing. So she's putting forward this idea of emotional governance. This collection of letters um, is undated, and Temple's side of the correspondence hasn't survived. And the readings it's been subjected to have, have tended to be very personalised. So in the first instance, that the selection was published as a supplement to the life of her husband. He was a famous statesman and essayist. And, and the biographer said, well, they're so uh, routine and clichéd that uh, just, just a few would suffice to illustrate the emotional life of this man. Etc. And then more recent critics tend to look at them as uh, a woman who was suffering, and one person just written an article about a which was suffering from you know, bipolar or something like this. So that they once again reading it in personal terms as a set of emotions that someone is struggling with and trying to govern through writing. Well, that seems to me a, a rather modern idea of what writing is supposed to be doing, but also. Um, it, it's uh, ignoring the broader context or refusing to situate this woman's discussion of emotion within a broader intellectual context. And in the work that I have done, I've tried to sketch out how um, Osborne's theories of emotions are implicit in these ideas, so the, the causing of emotions and the governance of emotions and so on. And then the absence of her husband's replies means that we've kind of only got one side of this, so how do we construct a context? Well, fortunately, he wrote a romance which is called The Constant Desperado, which is also, I know, but that word constancy invokes stoicism, and the desperado is someone who's running headlong into passion. And so you can see that through using this uh, romance, I could sketch a dialogue they were having about emotions and the importance of governance of emotions and holding those emotions together in the 1650s when royalism was a political position that had to be covert. And so that this philosophical language about emotions is about keeping those things under restraint, but also developing a sort of political profile that will be ready when the time comes uh, to expose such things. So I have another example, which is Margaret Cavendish, who I can talk to you about, who also dealt with stoicism in a later period in the 1660s. So, I know these are just sketchy beginnings, but I hope that I've um, demonstrated that the topic of gender and stoicism is certainly fertile material and that it may uh, introduce an interesting uh, new angle to a very, a very well-established chapter in intellectual history. Thank you. Yes, we have time for one question, if there's one from the audience. No? Okay, well, sh we shall continue then uh, with the next speaker. So, and what the next speaker is uh, setting up. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Hamilton. And Jennifer is, again, um, somebody who's joined you and E in recent memory. Um, you've been here for a little bit longer. Yes. Oh, no, I yes. You, 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 please look on. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, Jennifer, Jennifer um, is, um, <clears throat> she was an associate investigator with the Centre um, for the History of Emotions um, in 2017. Um, and she developed um, a project um, to support a symposium, feminist, queer, um, anti-colonial propositions for, to the, uh, for hacking the Amphitheatre scene. Um, two is that um, weathering. Oh, yeah. So that was the second one. What was, was the it? First yeah, one? really, like just rolled off the tongue. The title. <laughs> the first one was just uh, feminist, queer, anti-colonial propositions for hacking the Amphitheatre scene. Okay. Yes. And so this is the second the one. The sequel, and then we had a third one. Right. Yes. But, the, but yeah, the CHE supported the second one. 
Okay, and um, so um, her work on history of emotions um, have focused um, on King Lear, uh, with the chapter that culminated in the monograph, the contentious, this contentious storm. Um, this line of a quarry stemmed from her interest in Eve Sedgwick's work. Uh, of course, you're going to be talking about Eve Sedgwick again today um, uh, on the politics of feeling. Um, so. Without further ado, as you can read the rest of uh, Jennifer's biography there in your programs, it gives me great joy to introduce Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Um, and um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging we're meeting today on Anawan country and pay my respects to elders past and present um, and to extend those respects to any Indigenous people who might be with us today. Um, and also that I say that, I read an, a paper by Anita Heiss about why we do this. You know, it sometimes can be like a tokenistic way of beginning uh, a talk, but the reason why I do it anyway is I actually genuinely hope that we one day realise uh, a different way of relating to our violent colonial past. Okay, um, and thanks to the other speakers. Uh, it's been really great to hear your work. Death isn't a party you dress up for, man. It's strictly come as you are, so don't get too formal. It's useless. Don't grab that prosthesis, those elevator shoes, or girdle to jam your tummy in for our interview with Jesus or 49 days in the bardo of becoming. The point's not what becomes you, but what's you. Why did I buy those silk PJs with feathers so long before the affair began? I've always slept in the nude. Now I sleep in the nude forever. That's a posthumously published poem uh, by Eve Sedgwick from The Weather in Proust, which was a volume of her work uh, collected after she died. So this is the title of my paper, and it's, it's provisional work. Uh, in the short reflective essay, Being Prey, Val Plumwood makes several strong claims about what happens to indiv individualistic Western frameworks of subjectivity in traumatic near-death experiences. In sum, uh, when the experience is incorporated into the self through an eco-feminist and anti-human exceptionalist lens, these frameworks break and yield a new model of ecological subjectivity. In Plumwood's case, this happens after surviving um, and then reflecting on a crocodile attack. She describes this trauma as, quote, an experience beyond words of total terror. But out of the trauma develops an anti-human exceptionalist mode of embodiment based on opening up to a relational and mortal understanding of the self, the notion that we're all potentially crocodile food. Being prey is thus related to the seemingly grim cliche, we are all worm food, which I think also anticipates Donna Haraway's assertion that we are all compost, which is a refrain that's coming up in a lot of her contemporary work. Um, the shared inference in all these propositions is that humans die, will be metabolized by other than human forces, and that figuring out how to live in a more capacious, less defensive relation with death and decomposition is an important eco-political goal. A caveat, this goal is not universally applicable. It will do good work in some places and not in others. Um, so for example, Estrita Naimanis, a co collaborator, and I argue elsewhere that it is troubling to uncritically ask a poor person, refugee, or woman to be vulnerable, as is a move in some theoretical musings on um, reforming human nature relations at the moment. So inviting humans not to brace against, but to open up to the more than human in a way that sort of represents a vulnerability. But so too is it problematic to ask those without access to affordable food or health care, to those living in refugee camps or war zones, to those living in the wake of attempted colonial genocide, for example, to have a more capacious relationship with dying and death. That's a bit perverse. In many circumstances, far less room should be made for death. But in places with the privilege of low infant mortality and high life expectancy, with affordable access to health care and overall high standard of living, dying and death are marginal and hidden. And it's in this plush context where I think the messiness of death is sanitized, bureaucratized, and subcontracted to doctors, nurses, and funeral directors. And it's in this context that the idea of being prey or becoming compost has a lot of powerful 
provocative critical leverage. And this is where um, my interest in this question intersects with uh, the concerns of both the history of emotions and queer feminist <coughs> affect theory. Opening up to dying and death is not someone, something one can do on command, especially in a world where technology promises but does not always deliver um, the idea of saving off death for as long as possible. So opening to death is not a change in one's bodily posture, <coughs> sit down, straight back, eyes forward, but rather an emotional attunement of the self to others and arguably to the rest of the more than human world that might take time to cultivate. Like, any, uh, like holding a posture for any particular amount of time, it might give you a crick in the neck for a while while you get used to it. And more to the point, um, given most of us here have probably experienced the death of someone close to us, being open to death is most likely already taking time. That experience of grief is slow and difficult. It may take as long a time to learn how to live in a different relationship with death as it takes a wayward Catholic to unlearn the habits of body and mind that support the fantasy of heaven or fear of hell, for instance, or to grieve the loss of a loved one. So the other reason I'm interested in pursuing this question, aside from the sort of um, developing the eco-political assertions of Plumwood and Haraway, is um, relates to the pursuit of knowledge itself. Because this idea of dying and death is as much about being and doing as it is about knowing. How we know what we know, what we value, value as knowledge, and for whom or what end we are generating that knowledge. For example, we all know that we're going to die, but what does it mean to live with that knowledge? In, in fact, we already are living with that knowledge, potentially, but so how does this particular project actually change anything? I don't have an answer for that yet. Uh, teleologically geared outcomes oriented, uh, sorry, the teleologically geared outcomes oriented neoliberal academy undoubtedly values particular kinds of knowledges over others. Problems solved, cures discovered, weak genes eliminated, markets, uh, products marketed, papers published. This particular argument pursues a notion of living without fear amidst the messiness of earthly life as a durational experience. And so alongside um, Debbie Bird Rose, Michelle Jamison and Haley Singer, um, and a slew of other scholars who are sort of developing this idea at the moment, this is uh, one where the outcomes are unclear and where the game must be played slowly. The point is not what becomes you, but what's you. Eve Sedgwick died of breast cancer. So I'm just trying to keep myself on time here. Eve, uh, Eve Kososki Sedgwick died of breast cancer on the 12th of April 2009, 18 long years after she was first diagnosed, and somewhat strikingly, 12 years after it was found to be terminal. And I say striking for two reasons, because that is a kind of odds-beating survival in the, um, what S. Lachlan Jane calls the, uh, the notion of living in prognosis. Uh, if you're diagnosed with terminal breast cancer, you usually don't live for quite as long as Sedgwick did. Um, but also it strikes me as a really long time to sit with the knowledge that you're dying. The initial diagnosis came at the height of her career. She just published Between Men, English Literature and Male Homosocial Desire, that was in 85, and Epistemology of the Closet in 1990. The latter in particular, along with Judith Butler's slightly more famous but perhaps no less influential, influential gender trouble, arguably inaugurated the field of queer theory. So she was uh, really at the height of her powers. But in early 1991, she was diagnosed with a cancer that had already spread to her lymphatic system. And she describes it early on in an essay called Queer and Now, this is in 93, as a disease where the very, quote, best possible outcome will be decades and decades of free fall interpretive panic. <laughs> Meaning that the best outcome is to be effectively tortured by the known unknowns in cancer and the ongoing fear of recurrence. For Sedgwick, this anxious, fear-filled existence um, is at this point understood as a better outcome than a terminal diagnosis and inevitable death. In the 18 years from diagnosis to death, Sedgwick's position on this problem changes radically. Um, and it is an important part of all her subsequent scholarship. It's not that she manages to sublimate the fear, as her poem suggests, 
death isn't a party you dress up for, man. Um, but she works with it all the way, describing her relationship with, quote, rest, death, and non-being in the 2004 publication A Dialogue and Love as congenial. So she develops a congenial relationship with death. Tracing the trajectory of fear and anxiety in her work, or perhaps the striking absence thereof, and bearing in mind this autobiographical detail of her terminal cancer, we can find the way she works through these emotions simultaneously modelling the, uh, the kind and scale of work required to open up towards death, and this is largely emotional work. Um, and it also offers a kind of model for sub of subjectivity for how we might be able to sort of self-identify as prey or compost. Um, and this work, my work, sits in a strange cosmological zone and one that I want to think with and through more, but I haven't uh, yet. So fear of death, I think, historically has been managed by religious belief or faith and probably still is in a, in a number of contexts. Um, but the eco-politics of dying and death I'm dealing with here are, at least for now, best described as ostensibly secular. <coughs> they are of the earth and they do not seek transcendence from it. This strangeness can be further um, investigated and should be. But suffice to say for now, both Plumwood and Haraway hold to philosophies of imminence. They, um, they seek better worldly relations for their own sake, not for posthumous gain. So they seek, for instance, women's liberation or non-phobic systems of desire or anti-colonial societies or ecosystems flourishing. What Haraway calls, quote, getting on together with some grace. Her use of the notion grace arguably a nod to the selfless awesomeness of God, but reclaimed in this instance as the dominant purpose of uh, lived life's hard work. And Sedgwick does too, though she's not especially interested in environmental questions, but rather possibly liberating the study of gender and sexuality from theoretical regimes that seek to flatten and subdue the creative possibilities and perversities emergent in desire and difference. But, but the limitations of the body, the limits of the living organism itself guide her poetic pragmatism all the way. She's not seeking transcendence either. So what is the particular problem that the fear of death presents for environmental politics? In early responses to her shark, uh, shark attack, crocodile attack, Plumwood saw how her story was co-opted and turned into a tale of heroism or a story of quasi-sexual violence. In all instances, these stories emphasize the triumph of the human over rogue forces of nature, reinforcing her own theory of interlocking dualisms outlined in feminism and the mastery of nature. So this idea that's human and nature, male and female, rationality, animality, active, passive, these are structuring logics of Western thought, thought that for, for Plumwood will stand and fall together. So all, they all kind of hold together and hold the society together and, you know, in order to sort of overcome uh, this human nature distinction, we also need to have a sort of non-binary notion of what gender relations are. In Being Prey, she reclaims the story with a, quote, um, a significance quite the opposite of that conveyed in the master monster narrative. For her, it's a humbling and cautionary tale about our relationship with the earth and about the need to acknowledge our own animality and ecological vulnerability. Left to its own devices, the story would have remained one of human conquest over this apparently discrete realm of nature. So in other words, fear of death is related to human exceptionalism and manifests as the desire not to be subject to earthly forces. Haraway raised a Catholic rejects epistemologies of transcendence because she asserts that they produce fraught relations with the earth and strange ways of knowing the earth and each other. She says, quote, the powers of terror or earth infuse its tissues everywhere. She claims, despite the civilizing efforts of the agents of the sky gods to astralize them and set up chief singletons and tame committees of multiples or sub-gods, for her, fear of death breeds um, the desire for an otherworldly life, and that shapes the way the world is imagined and studied. Resisting an epistemology of transcendence is Haraway's chief point of departure. She is a creature of the mud and not the sky, and thinking with the earth rather than across it or about it is the mode of knowledge production that emerges from this different point of view. So on the one hand, I agree with the imperative that one should be notionally open to becoming 
food for another and one ought to be reconciled to our imminent compostability, one does not often feel open to these things. And following Sedgwick, then, I seek um, to turn the seemingly uncircumnavigable question of how people should feel um, to the much harder ones of how they do and how feelings change. If a lived process, <coughs> if a lived openness to death and decomposition is important for environmental politics, then fear of dying needs to be grappled with as an important part of this process. So what happens to Sedgwick's work after her diagnosis? She leans into the complicated zone of emotions or affect, as always already both the drivers of political desires for things to be otherwise or for political change, and also as the main barrier to its fulsome realization. In some ways, emotions are always kind of self-defeating or get stuck in feedback loops. An example she gives in Touching Feeling, uh, a 2004 collection of essays, is on the promise of pride as opposed to shame. So this is like gay pride, black is beautiful pride, and so on. She says, quote, the therapeutic or political strategies aimed at getting rid of individual or group shame have something preposterous about them. They may work, they certainly have powerful effects, but they can't work in the way they say they work. This, she argues, is largely because shame is not, quote, a toxic part of the self that can be excised, but, quote, rather integral to the residual um, processes by, way, uh, by which identity itself is formed. So shame constitutes the self as much. So it's not something you can just kind of cut off like a limb, um, but it is of the self and must be worked through. I understand this um, as a similar dynamic in relation to fear of death and dying in whatever form they may manifest. That is, one cannot simply remove the fear of death and dying like one may have surgery to remove a tumour and to live out fully formed uh, compostable being or being prey as a result. Because one conception of death is imminently tied to the architecture of our psyches, our relations with others, and the world itself already. So finally, what can Cedric's work tell us about becoming prey or compost, about opening the self towards death, and how can she be a shepherd in this process? sort of between closing the gap between the assertion of Haraway and um, Plumwood, that idea we need to sort of open to death differently, and the sort of emotional barriers to actually doing that. And these are all sort of provisional conclusions. This is sort of very much work in progress. So, as I've already said, Sedgwick's sort of main offering in affect studies is that emotions are as much enablers and indicators of things as they are radically self-defeating. Um, so desire tells us something about what we want the world to be, but it can also uh, be difficult to realise. If someone cries because of something someone else does, this is an indicator that something's not right. Um, and needs to be changed, but how you go about that is not necessarily straightforward or clear. Shame can thwart the desired expression of the self at the same time as it constitutes that desire. These effective feedback loops participate in politics, and as such there's no going around these emotions, one must, one must work through them. In a dialogue on love, she, she, she actually uh, represents her years in therapy after her cancer diagnosis as a kind of indicator of the difficulty of emotional processing massive trauma. Um, so, you know, a trauma can't just be sort of held up as an idea and then passed over really quickly. It's actually a long process. Um, so develop, to develop a more, quote, congenial relationship with death, one might need to go through a similarly durational process. In the weather in Proust, she floats the idea of epistemological modesty, which I think is also a really interesting one, um, which perhaps can set certain humble limits on what we know and what we can claim to know and how we can claim to know it. I think this idea um, supports what we can know about emotions as much as kind of opens up to the unknowingness of that emotional space. Um, yeah. And I think what's really interesting about all of this 
um, which I don't go into at all except for like giving a little teaser of her own poetic writing, is that this comes out of the work of a literary studies scholar. Um, she's a sharp reader of Gothic fiction, of the work of Henry James and Proust and others. And I, I guess um, it's possible that reading literature and poetry grounded in what's already here is one of the most profound ways into learning how to live with the difficult emotions of uh, dying and death, of learning how to live the idea that life is not what becomes you, but what is you. Um, and so I'll leave it there and I look forward to some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that. Um, what we're going to do now is open up to questions. So um, I'd like to invite the speakers back up to, onto the floor. We've got some chairs coming out as I speak. Thank you, Crystal. Um, and so that uh, we're able to discuss, um, we're able to discuss, uh, yes, okay, I'm happy to sit here. Thank you, Crystal. Um, discuss the points. So in the talks that um, we've heard th this afternoon so far, one of the things that has struck me is we've all been talking about emotions, but we've been talking about emotions in various different ways. Kate, for example, has described how emotions, that is a vocabulary of emotions, can be subjected to a systematic behavioral machine, essentially, so that we're able to regulate journalistic decisions in particular ways. Diana has spoken about neo-stoicism, and quite interesting from the perspective of how in the 17th century um, it was taken and gendered subject to particular gendered language and I mean for so I sort of knew stoicism largely from the perspective of Seneca so this is sort of revelation for me to hear that and um, whereas you've talked about how uh, out of a personal subjective experience we might learn a particular model for regulation and ask particular questions Jennifer about our experience of death and our attitude to death so in some ways the what we've been discussing is different forms of emotion haven't we and how re emotion is regulated by different systems of thought and approach Approaches. And for me, some of these questions that arise is how much is this, how much is this, let's just talk about the ecological, how much is this perspective on emotion determined by the particular context in which it arises? It's a rather general question, but I think you can um, address it each from your particular perspectives. Um, who would like to start? In talking about what kind of historical, social, political context that makes discussion about emotion <coughs> significant. Is that, yes. Okay. Well, uh, that that was my that is my approach to history of emotions is to try and think about what work these emotions or discussion of emotions is doing in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. So that that's um, key to what interests me. So not so much as. Um, a philosophy of emotions, but what generated that philosophy, that what that philosophy was trying to address, what work it was trying to do in the real world. I don't know if that's really an answer. But... Um, it, it's a bit hard to know, really. I mean, I did some of this research, um, as I said, eight years ago, maybe ten years ago, um, and since then. I've been amazed at how much research has gone into emotions in the online world um, and social media and how much it's affecting and impacting on all of us. Uh, and so I think we just need to uh, keep looking closer at what's actually being done there uh, with language for emotions anyway. Um, I'm not sure that I'm on the track here, but, uh, you know, I, th I, th I think that this is, these are the things in our in our world, our online world, that we, we're not aware of and that it's important that we do become aware of, of what's sort of shaping our behaviours online. Yeah, I think that some of the systematic approaches you propose, Kate, they, they have particularly interesting <coughs> terms. Could you see them as being used for discourse analysis more generally? Well, absolutely. I mean, the point of me doing that research was actually like a pushback, if you like, for journalism, rather than, you know, let's just do exactly what the um, search and sort of commercial world is doing. But uh, on the other hand, um, it might be that you need to borrow from them in order to kind of beat the beast, if I can put it that way, um, in terms of ethics and, and maybe using emotions in a different way. Because if emotions can be used to generate profits, why can't they be used for ethics? I think that's a good point for you to pick up on, Jim. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think I agree with what 
you said, Diana, about the way in which the question, the, emotion, the emotional uh, aspect of this question kind of was thrown up by the particular problem that um, of how to get by in an ecologically changing world. Um, and these, these claims that um, I sort of agree with in Haraway and Plumwood, which are like, have quite a lot of traction in environmental humanities work, I feel do um, excise the big kind of emotional or existential <laughs> challenge of what it actually means to, to sort of die. Um, and so, yeah, it, and having this kind of background in the history of emotions lended itself to asking that question. Naturally, naturally, yes. Um, I'm wondering if there's points that uh, the audience would like to pick up on. No, that's not important to say. Um, um, just we'll wait for the oh, Sorry, I just, I just had a thought. I, when, when I first got involved with the history of emotions, it was emotions. How can they have a history? They're everywhere. We all have them. They're without a history. And so, to some extent, your question kind of pushes on that, 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 that these things that we experience as part of ourselves and possibly timeless actually may be timely and tied to certain historical contexts and meanings. And Absolutely. the gendering of those emotions may shift over time, too. Yes, and grand medics. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple of points for Diana, if I may, please. Um, you were talking about uh, Stoicism as uh, pretty much a withdrawal from the state, but um, as I recollect, uh, a lot of the Roman oligarchy actually adopted Stoicism, and for the great general, apatheia meant uh, being able to endure the pain of wounds uh, without complaining, or going for long periods without sleep, or going without food for long periods, that, that kind of thing. And so it was pretty much bound up with a lot of the uh, governing norms of, of, the, of the place too. And of course Seneca was uh, tutor to the Emperor Nero, uh, bound up with the court itself. Um, the other point I want to make was that you, um, I think, implied that um, the Puritans, in a sense, rediscovered Stoicism for their own purposes. but. Uh, there was a, a very direct affinity between Stoicism and Christianity right from the start. Uh, for example, the uh, Cleanthes hymn to Zeus is, uh, to Zeus is uh, very much uh, similar to the Christian idea of, of God. Um, there was a um, quite unsubstantiated fanciful tradition that St Paul and Seneca were good friends. Um, with no, no evidence surviving for it, but uh, it's a nice idea in somebody's head. But, it, but more concretely, the fourth gospel actually adopts the Stoic Logos philosophy, holos bolus. It's very, very close to Thank you. Just wait for my friend to come back. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, they're interesting um, observations and reminders, and certainly anything I say about the classical period is always flattened out in order to throw the light on the early moderns. Uh, uh, so I am aware that it's a bit more complex than I suggest. I didn't mean to suggest that um, the uh, Puritans rediscovered Stoicism. That was just the thread I was picking out in terms of the example I was talking about. The second example would have perhaps given a bit more light on the breadth of the ideas as far as I see them. Thank you so much. I'll follow up on those ideas. Can I just add, add yes, something? Please. I just finished reading this book, What is the History of Emotions, published this year, and there's actually a great section in there on the exact point you just raised about suffering and the Christian virtues and emotions uh, in this book early on. Yeah, really well, Rosenbaum, if they reference Martin Nussbaum? Other questions? Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. It was a really stimulating panel. Um, I guess picking up on Diana, your, your one of your responses to, one, to the early question, you know, what's it, um, a, about, you know, the idea that emotions used to be timeless, or that we all have emotions all the time, and you know, what's the point of trying to historicise them? Um, it seems to me, particularly, I mean, actually, in all three panels, in different, in all three papers, in different ways. Um, that there's a real kind of, you know, socio-cultural and historical location for these emotions. And I wonder whether, um, 
perhaps in a, like perhaps um, I'm aware of using doing the uh, Alanis Morissette irony, but but you know, in an, perhaps in a slightly ironic way, maybe this this focus on emotions and the historicizing. I wonder I wonder how much um, historicizing of emotions or locating them in time and place is. I mean, particularly um, Jennifer, you know, you're talking about this 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 concept that you want us to kind of embrace in terms of death. Um, it's, it's too much to ask of some groups, you know, that we shouldn't be kind of um, asking these people to be more vulnerable or, you know, more open to death. Um, but I wonder whether these emotions actually um, highlight the ways in which we're almost completely cut off in some ways from, from other people, or that our experience of life is so different um, and our emotions are so personal and so um, particular. I, I wonder, in fact, whether, whether using emotions as a kind of a, a binding force of humanity, um, I wonder if there's limits to that now in this, in this project. Jennifer, so. um, well, yes and no. <laughs> Can I say that? I think so. One of said in Epistemology of the Closet, her first axiom, which is kind of guides the rest of her work, is people are different from each other. And she says it's surprising how few uh, theoretical frameworks and concepts we have for dealing with that obvious fact that difference kind of is abundant. And she tries to work with that constantly, almost like dogmatically through the rest of her career. She just kind of, kind of keeps coming back like a refrain. Um, and, and for, you know, the, uh, for her, the work of Sylvan Tompkins and affect feedback loops and the different ways in which they can kind of constitute and loop back on each other is a great way of sort of trying to access that difference um, and multiplicity. But at the same time, um, in the work that I've done on performance and emotion, there is this kind of striking contagion when it comes to affect in a, the context of a performance, like overwhelming kind of uh, happiness or joy or like um, excitement or grief that can be given, like brought up by the performance of a great tragedy or something that actually does kind of can be read in common in interesting ways. So I, but I do think you kind of need to do both and it's actually powerful if you can do both rather than kind of focusing on the radical individuality of the emotion or its huge communality. So in response to what I would say to that idea about the tension between emotions as something experienced individually or perhaps across a community, I'd say that my emphasis is to work towards the community rather than to focus on the individual. And that's partly for feminist reasons because that sort of connection between women writers and emotion and women writers and the personal is a bit of a one-way lane down somewhere very interesting and private, whereas I'm much more interested in trying to think about how they might situate what they've got to say within a broader conversation, hence the tying of it to um, a courtesy manual, to, um, but not just a courtesy manual, because then you have women just attached to paradigms that are workaday, straightforward, handbook kind of ideas, the pop press, if you like, but also those ideas tie into the elite intellectual discussions of the day. And so strategically, I don't want to read it personally, but I do in the second half of the paper that I didn't give, I would concede that these women turn to these theories for personal reasons. There's, that's definitely part of it. But what they turn to is a discourse that has um, a broader circulation, that has authority because it is linked into other um, respected ideas and centres of meaning and culture. Yeah, I mean, just a, a quick uh, add-on to that. I mean, my talk was about um, emotion intelligence, and we know how dumb even machine intelligence can be. So emotion intelligence is going to be um, pretty sort of um, weak compared to the complexity of hu raw human emotions. Um, and I think that this idea of the personal and then for the community is an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure we're going to solve that today. <laughs> We have a question at the back. I think it raises a lot of very interesting questions around the tension between uh, deconstructive narratives that focus upon individuality as opposed to the job of historians often looking at collective responses to particular ideas and emotion in our case. Jennifer. Okay. Thanks, all three, for a wonderful panel. Um, look, this might be a really naive question, but what I've noticed in the papers, uh, Jen, a minute ago you were talking about uh, this affective transmission between audience and, and um, text, but 
Is there a semantic slippage going on between the word affect and emotions? It, I mean, maybe, maybe the psychologists in the room can tell me, but are they the same thing or is affect and emotion two different kind of concepts? I just, I'm just thinking, I just, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I think, I think it's an, an interesting question. And I know that in Sedgwick she talks extensively about affect and I think it's an interesting word, uh, the etymology of it, I mean, that it, it's a, a word that does as well as receives, that it can excite. There are all these sort of other connotations around the word affect. Thanks for the microphone. Great question. Thank you, Crystal. comment. In the early modern period, it's passions, not affect or emotion. So. Oh, and in computing, it's called effective computing. That's what it's called. I haven't figured it out. <laughs> I can't say that, can you? <laughs> but I, I mean, I think, I think that the way that the, the distinction I have in my mind is so Sedgwick's use of affect comes through sort of Sylvan Tompkins and it's kind of a psychological like scientific cybernetic concept that's very um, modern and I guess when I use maybe I, I think that I just interchange them in probably a problematic way but maybe I do have a sense of emotion having a more kind of historical poetic sense and affects with being more contemporary and a bit more biological maybe. But, yeah, I, d I definitely think that you've identified the slip that <laughs> will remain slip um, I, I don't have the definition there, but emotions were uh, interactions between internal and external, so they are biological. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it seems to be... Uh, neurotransmitters, are chemical, you know, dopamine, whatever it is, serotonin yeah, and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And all those things are at work with the external environment as well as, you know, they're the internal things. and. That autonomic system is is a you know a hidden chemistry. Well, uh, one thing I forgot to say in response to Christina's question was shame is like the reason why Cedric gets kind of attracted to the to um, to affect is through shame and it's it's radic like on the one hand it's this radically social emotion um, because it kind of is first felt in the presence of someone who's unfamiliar, like this is kind of the psychological, psychoanalytic definition. Um, but it's also a sense of like an experience of the self by the self, so it's a deeply isolating emotion. But in response to this kind of question about affect and biology and emotion, it also manifests biologically through trembling and blushing and like the eyes kind of automatically being downcast. So it's not just of the mind, it's also of the body. Of course, that, those were some of the signs that Stoics were often uh, very concerned with observing and then warding off the following emotion, weren't they? Um, so I, I think, yeah, um, are there more questions? Yes. yes. Honours student Linda Shostovia. <laughs> so can we say that... Um, like as in the articles represented by Barbara Rosenbein, that um, changing communities and social um, uh, areas or communities that were there in the earlier years um, brought about those changes of emotions, but then going to William Reddy's concept of um, the regimes and um, the refuges where that, can we say that the change throughout those, the history of emotions could be represented by a, um, a rebellion against, brings about the changes by our, our uh, emotional rebellion or wanting to come about by making a change that could be influenced by our, um, like precipitates that change, then we come about by, th throughout the centuries, we could see that has evolved by our individual um, if I'm explaining this right, the individual basis that brings about that change. 
right, influences that change. Uh, uh, yes. So I think, yes, your question is largely to do with what are some of the factors that bring about changes in regimes of a nation or changes in... Yeah, the, it's an yeah. interesting, complex question. No. I mean, I, I don't know, but I do think this book does explain some of that, again, pointing back to this point, because I think um, this takes you through the importance of, like, the heart, where there was a lot of focus on the heart at one point as a centre of emotions. How much can and, you say is individual-based? Well, no, it, I think it's historical contexts that count and the kinds of things that Diana's talking about in that era w w was a time when there was a lot of change going on. And I think it's really useful to just sort of read further about that in here. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the contemporary um, notions are that, that emotions are, are pretty much governed now by the central nervous system and, and the brain and those, those features inside our brain um, in, in different ways. And I, whereas that was not known in that period um, when we're talking about Dorothy Osborne. So, you know, the, the heart would have been the centre at that point of emotions. So, yes, we've come a, a long way. And, but, yeah, read the book. But also now there's all of the sort of science coming out about the gut. Gut. I find this really interesting. I think in, um, in Sedgwick's work, so I don't, yeah, it, um, she is a scholar of sexuality and desire, and so, and the desire for another, and a desire that's not necessarily socially acceptable in all contexts and that desire is like a clue that things are unjust or wrong and that social change needs to occur to enable just sort of liberty in a way and so I think kind of almost desire is integral to so any how kind does of that change. change occur again? How does that change, social change occur? I don't know, like, where do you begin? Um, I think it's a so rather large question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I think that, yeah. like, at least the... So time will make that change, is that right? So will that change? Um, or circumstance makes change? Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, we've got a question. Yeah. Jump on it. I'll just say, look, there's a, there's, a <laughs> there's a complex set of transactions, I think, that are going on, and I think that's probably the simplest way to answer that. You can't space it, it's just one thing. Well, like, I suppose, like, by way of example, like, oh, sorry, by way of example, like, we, we like, so, so if, if, example, like, we, so if to take Sedgwick's work in um, queer sexuality studies as an example, and to think about that in the Australian context, um, you know, there were plenty of people living um, closeted homosexual lives um, under fear of persecution in the late, you know, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and people kind of got on the streets and then eventually lobbied for, like, change. You know, so change happens in kind of painfully slow processes. The role of emotion in that varies greatly. I guess my point was that uh, the, the desire for change kind of seeds itself emotionally um, as well. I suppose we would put that as a great refuge, is that right, Jason? I mean, a refuge that makes brings about the change. I think you're referring to Reddy, are you? Yeah. Yes. It'll be interesting to see what influence Mark Zuckerberg has in the next 10 years on emotions. Just watch the space. It might be in his big toe, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the presenters for these excellent presentations. Um, I have a question that I think relates to ideas presented by the presenters or the presenters in different ways regarding regulation of emotion and balance of emotion. Um, in relation to Eve Sedgwick's um, longevity, uh, despite her diagnosis of terminal cancer, um, so I, I wondered about your ideas, uh, this is from a psychological perspective, this question, your ideas regarding um, 
how perhaps is expressed through her work, E. Sedgwick regulated and balanced emotional regulation and her longevity. So my thoughts were perhaps the um, fear of death she experienced at the beginning might have motivated her towards certain health enhancing behaviors or treatments. I, I know nothing about her life, but I'm guessing perhaps there she dealt with her emotions in a way that helped enhance longevity by fueling motivation to fear. Um, but then later, perhaps as she accepted um, more imminent death, perhaps she felt less stress and um, by regulating emotions <coughs> in a way that resulted in less stress, that might have enhanced um, her longevity. So in a way, this relates to your question about context. Perhaps it was the stage of this quite long-term illness and how she dealt with it. Um, so I think that relates somewhat to stoicism, perhaps, and to the physiology and steps of emotion <laughs> regulation. I was just wondering if you have ideas about the, um, especially in the case of Eve uh, Sedgwick, um, how these emotion regulation processes might have related to her exceptional longevity. We'll give you a moment to collect your thoughts on that. Yes. So, Jennifer. I would, I don't know, again, <laughs> uh, but I, and I don't think we can know, and I think this comes to that point about epistemological modesty that, I, that she made, like what, what can we know and what can't we know. Um, and I'm kind of nervous to say this, but she did turn to, towards Buddhism. Um, she, her you know, um, her courses changed structure, like she ran these sort of extraordinary long courses on um, like year-long seminars reading Proust and she had these kind of extraordinary poetry writing craft seminars, you know, this is at the City University of New York, you know, like so her pedagogy changed in response to that, like she kind of, I guess because she was in this sort of powerful point in her career after she'd written these landmark texts, she was able to kind of do what she wanted um, and yeah like so I don't know necessarily about emotional regulation and low cortisol levels or whatever but um, yeah certainly and th there's no way to know that but she certainly did change her process uh, her pedagogy and her life practice um, in in Sir William Temple's um, fantastic romance the the constant desperado, everybody who doesn't govern their emotions dies. <laughs> well, move forward a few hundred years, and the W3C has standards for regulations for representation of emotions. So we've come a long way. <laughs> What are, what are those, some of those regulations? Um, actually, one of them that is, is uh, mind-boggling is accuracy in representation of emotions. Uh, and the only way you can do that is obviously through uh, consensus and that sort of ontological approach that I talked about where um, a domain, a particular domain, for example, like journalism, would agree that these are the emotions that might exist in this particular domain for these particular transactions and transitions that would happen. It's almost so, it's so malleable, it will change so often. Uh, the standards are really just regulations that are there for people uh, investing in it. I, I actually only found these in recent weeks, so, um, and they are only there since about 2014, that, that the World Wide Web Consortium, you know, Tim Berners-Lee set that standard up uh, many years ago in 2001. Um, and so um, I'll be looking at that for my future research in this area because I think it's really important. Okay. Um, yes. There's two questions here. So uh, <coughs> I think. Uh, Just a quick question: uh, Whether we put emojis on the web or 
with a silly question, but I had to ask. What do you want? <laughs> No, no, they're just a representation. They are very simplistic. Um, there is actually a lot of, yeah. But look, there's a lot of more advanced facial recognition technology now, which I haven't talked about today. That's another talk that perhaps I'll do as well. I think they're interesting, though, in terms of the way they can regulate emotions, in terms of when there's somebody responds big to those. Into it. Mm. Um, Julia. Thank you. Um, I, this question, I guess, is uh, directly, specifically to Diana. Um, I was very interested in, um, of course, the reception of, of, of Seneca um, in uh, 17th century England. And I was wondering, uh, what was like for his plays? Because his plays are famous for conveying these excessive, exaggerated emotions and, um, and really. Um, so, so what was the, um, the, the, was Seneca still represented in 17th century? Like particularly given that um, in, in England, in fact, uh, thanks to the, to the work, the commentary of Nicholas Trevet, uh, Seneca became really quite famous very quickly and from there throughout Europe. So, yeah, I was, and, and how does it uh, ties in with, uh, um, I, I guess, um, the, the, the moral message that comes through uh, the letters uh, to Lucilius? <coughs> Well, you've outlined an area that I have earmarked for myself to research, but I haven't yet done the work. But I, the, the starting point for me would be the circle um, with Mary Sidney, Sir Philip Sidney's uh, sister, and she wrote uh, that she responded to a translation of uh, Seneca and wrote a play that is a direct um, adaptation of Seneca. I've read the play, I've started to think about it, but I can't say much more than that except that it is an engagement with Seneca and ideas, and it does have political import, both in terms of the notions of the state and in terms of gender. So that is a chapter I will write that will start this work on gender and stoicism. So thank you. I'll look forward to discussing it. Rose Williamson, did you have a question? No, no sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, I think it's now afternoon tea, isn't it, Crystal? Um, and hopefully it's out there. So um, would you like to join me in thanking our three speakers? What's been a fascinating question?